Hi, I'm so happy to see everyone virtually. My name is Mike. I use they, them pronouns, and I am a full-time conservation educator at the New York Aquarium in Brooklyn. I'm super excited to be here with you all to talk about STEM careers and my personal pathway through the STEM lattice and how you can get involved in STEM careers and being passionate about science. So I have a quick presentation and we'll go through it. We'll talk about my history in STEM. And then like Taylor said, we're gonna dive right into our shark exhibit at the New York Aquarium, which I'm so excited to share with you all. So this entire presentation is about career pathways in STEM. I'm gonna basically share with you my life story <laughs> in a way, how I got here, where my passions arose um, in the ocean and kind of the advice that I have for all of you if you are young, if you're middle-aged, if you're older age, if you still wanna get involved in STEM, there are plenty of ways for you to do that. So what is STEM? First of all, what is this acronym that we've been throwing around this whole time? So STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. This acronym was created to better describe areas in science that people are involved in, whether it's their career, they do research in it, maybe they are in school studying one of these fields, or they're just passionate about it. So STEM is a really great way to kind of describe a large field of science and the different components of those fields of science, like technology, engineering, and math. Recently, there's actually been another acronym that's been created to kind of expand on STEM, and that is STEAM, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Mathematics, which is really cool. I'm an artist, so I love kind of having the arts brought into science because there is a lot of science in art and creativity like that. But today we are gonna be focusing on STEM. So my background um, and kind of where my passion started, I'm from New York. I grew up in Brooklyn and Long Island. I'm a native New Yorker. I've been here my whole life. And my passion for the environment really started when I was very, very young. I was lucky enough to have a grandmother who uh, lived close to the water. She lived in a community called Breezy Point, which is underneath this um, like yellow star that you see. It's at the end of a peninsula that's right off the coast of New York. So it's very much in New York Harbor and the waterways around there. But there was a specific body of water where my passions grew and I was able to explore the most when I was younger. And this place was called Jamaica Bay. Jamaica Bay is um, an incredible place. It's filled with biodiversity. It is such a densely populated area too. This is Brooklyn. There's so many people that live in Brooklyn around here. JFK Airport is right there. So there are planes flying everywhere and there are birds everywhere. It's a really hectic place, but it is filled with biodiversity. And that's really where my passion started. My dad also grew up in this area. He grew up in Breezy Point. So he had the same type of environment to influence him when he was younger. So I grew up with him kind of, you know, taking me snorkeling. We would go diving in Jamaica Bay. He would show me different areas and abandoned places that animals and nature have kind of taken over. But he also shared with me a lot of stories about how the bay looked like when he was younger. He told me about tropical fish that would come up in the Gulf Stream and they would be really pretty and have all of these different colors and how brilliantly vibrant the water was when he was younger. And my image of that was much different. I grew up in the late 90s and the early 2000s and New York at that time was struggling with a lot of pollution and we still are. So my vision of Jamaica Bay was not as pristine as my dad was describing it. So I saw garbage and I saw different types of pollution Yet through all of those kind of barriers, I still saw the beauty of this ecosystem and I saw the inhabitants that were there and how important they were to the health of this ecosystem. So this is a picture of what Jamaica Bay would look like if you were standing there today. You can see the Empire State Building in the background. It's really incredible because the dichotomy of like having a huge city in the background and then this really lush, beautiful salt marshes and the bay and the water, it's, it's incredible to see. So. I grew up here, I spent all my time here when I was a kid and I started to in interact with the environment and I started to ask myself questions of, okay, what are the birds doing here? Why are they only in this area? You know, I'm, I'm seeing trash on the beach and I'm wondering how it got here. I'm even seeing trash in the water. I actually was snorkeling one time and found a completely submerged motorcycle in Jamaica Bay. It was like a full on dune bike that was about 12 feet under and I actually ran into it. And then I realized what I had, had hit and I surfaced and I was freaking out. But it was, it kind of shows like the state that this bay has been in for a very long time and that 
I also noticed that there was a lack of education in this area that people weren't really treating this area and this ecosystem with the stewardship that it deserves to keep it at the best possible health and to keep these animals really, really healthy. Uh, there's also a picture of one of my favorite animals, one of the favorite native animals that lives in Jamaica Bay on the bottom of the screen. This is a northern pipefish. So they're the fish and organism that I associate most with my memories there. These guys are related to seahorses. They kind of have that similar snout in the front, but they don't have that belly or that wrapped up tail. However, they do wrap themselves around pieces of seaweed at the bottom of the bay. So when I was a kid, I would look after rocks or big shells that had seaweed growing off of it, and I would just pick up the whole thing. And eight out of 10 times, I would have a pipefish in my hand afterwards. So that was a really awesome connection that I had. I saw how beautiful the animals that were there. And I started to ask myself, okay, this place is great. I have such a connection here. You know, what else is there to be learned about this place? I wanna know about the ecology. I wanna know about the biology, but I also wanna know about how humans are using this area to their benefit, but also to the detriment of a lot of animals that live there. So jumping way ahead, now we're blowing right past middle school and high school. I wanted to learn more about marine science. I really wanted to dive into the sciences and get a better idea of the actual processes of what I was curious about. Cause I could just look at the ocean and think whatever I wanted to, but to actually understand it, to understand what's going on underneath the water is something special. So I was lucky enough to be enrolled in Stony Brook University, which is where Taylor and I went. We both got our degrees there. And this is out east on Long Island. So it's further out east. If anyone knows Montauk, it's about an hour outside of Montauk at the end of Long Island. But Stony Brook University is a STEM college. It's very focused on science and technology and especially mathematics. So this I knew was an area I wanted to be in. I'm, I love science if you can't already tell. <laughs> so I wanted to be around like-minded people. So this was a really great place for me to jump into. What was the cherry on top of the cake was that Stony Brook actually has an entire campus dedicated to studying the ocean and to studying ecosystems around the ocean. So this campus is called SOMAS. It's the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. And their campus is filled with uh, a ton of resources that undergraduates and graduate students could use to further their interests about the ocean. So I was super excited about this. I could not believe that this opportunity existed. And this building that you see in the picture here is our marine science research station. So this is, I think, like a $25 million building that was constructed and was specifically made to support the marine sciences major and the atmospheric sciences major. So it's an incredible resource for us. Taylor and I came in right around the time that this like was open. So we were like some of the first people to use this building, which was so cool. Um, you can see there's plenty of boats. There are people, there's research happening on the docks. Taylor and I know very well, we've spent hours and countless nights in dark weather, horrible weather, just sitting out here doing all of our research. So this is a great thing to kind of get back into. And this resource was available to us. So the thing that I was curious about was, you know, where do I start? This resource is there. How do I understand, you know, getting into this field? What do I do? What's my first step in? My biggest advice to anybody who is interested in getting into the sciences is to volunteer. Your ability to volunteer is the best thing that you have to advance your career in STEM. So I thankfully was given that advice early on. Some people even start in high school, but I was able to start in college. And my freshman year, I looked up different labs that Stony Brook had. I was looking up labs that were closer to the ocean that were doing things that I was interested in. And I settled on the Peterson Marine Ecology Lab. Now this was a lab that was focusing on seagrass and I knew seagrass, I, I had seen some seagrass in Jamaica Bay when I was younger, but I didn't really understand that seagrass is an ecosystem, that there are hundreds of species that rely on this plant to be able to live and they call this place home. So I volunteered and my volunteer work was pretty interesting. I basically did anything they told me, but it was filled with STEM principles. I was building materials. I was repairing different systems that were being used in experiments. I was measuring crabs. I was measuring snails. We were going out and collecting these crabs and snails from the bay itself. So I was fully engrossed in this type of science and really getting my hands dirty in my first ever research experience. And that had a really 
strong impact on me as a freshman. I knew that there was a pathway into this. I had worked with a grad student. Um, her name is Rebecca Culp. She's the lovely kind of traffic cone person looking in the middle. <laughs> but Rebecca was the grad student that um, I drifted towards the most because she was working uh, and doing all of these incredible things with seagrass. So she was doing a PhD, which is a lot. And th there's a lot that you can explore in a PhD. And one of the things that she had trouble with was she wanted to explore too much. She didn't have enough time to really go after all of the questions that she had and all the experiments that she wanted to do. So she was looking for volunteers like myself and Taylor to help out with that work. So we worked together and I basically went up to Rebecca and said, you know, what, what do you want to do that you don't have time to do? Like, we will do that for you. <laughs> I, I wanna be able to do that so that, you know, we can push forward on your degree, but I can also get some experience under my belt. So my first summer there, I, uh, you know, Rebecca agreed that I can help her on her thesis, um, but sh there was one caveat and I had to find funding to be able to do this. I wasn't just gonna do it willy nilly. She didn't have the money for me. So I had to find my own funding to be able to make this happen. So part of being in STEM is going after the money because these efforts and researching and exploring different areas of the world, they require a lot of finances. So I went out, I got some funding for myself that first summer. It wasn't a lot, but it was enough to do a little bit. <laughs> so we were able to kind of start this journey together. And I started working on some of the aspects of her thesis that she didn't have time for. And that's where Taylor came in. This first summer that we did, it was, I think summer of 2015, if I'm correct. <laughs> we really was, it was like bare bone science. We were just trying things out. And remember, this was ideas that Rebecca had that she had never tried in person. So I was like the trial run for all of this. We were cutting up boxes. We were you know, duct taping GoPros together. It was bananas, but we were doing everything that we could to kind of make our skills emerge through this type of process, but also to do some actual research. Eventually, we um, kind of regrouped once the summer was over and once the field season was over. And I had a better idea of, both me and Rebecca had a better idea of what this research was going to look like. So at that point, I started to look for more money because this research was gonna be bigger and I needed some big bucks to make it happen. So what I did was I went out and, oops, oh no, that's the right side. <laughs> I started exploring what I was interested in. So. Rebecca's work was involving seagrass, but what I was interested more in was like the interaction between animals in this ecosystem, right? The seagrass itself, the plant itself is really fascinating. And there was a lot of research being done on the plant itself, but I was more curious about like the little critters that were living in this ecosystem, like the crabs and the mussels and the oysters and the snails that all called this place home. So. I was interested in a particular species called the Sai mud crab. This is this little guy in kind of like a little jar that we had um, in some of our in some of our research bins. But this is a native crab that lives in Long Island. You can find it actually in a lot of places along the east coast of North America. But they are native, which was really cool. We really wanted to focus on studying native species to better understand the history of this ecosystem. So these crabs are super tiny. They only get about this big. And you can find them in all different types of habitats. Seagrass habitats, they live uh, just on bare sand. They like to hide in shells. They'll hide in oyster reefs. They can hide under piers and different boats and stuff. So they're really diverse and they had a really widespread range. And I wanted to understand how they were using their habitat and how their habitat was affecting them. So my second summer in the lab, I, like I said, I went after some more money to get my research done. I was able to get a bigger grant to kind of further this research with Rebecca. And I settled on studying how these crabs eat, their prey, uh, their predator behavior, what kind of prey that they go after. So what I was looking at was with all of these different habitats that the crab lives in, I wanted to see if it preferred certain types of prey over others. I used a blue mussel, which is the mussel that most of us eat when we go to restaurants. And I used a slipper snail, which was a local species of snail that could be found in Long Island. And those were, my, those were my two prey items. And basically I uh, put these crabs in buckets overnight and I recorded them to see what types of prey they went after. I had different sizes of prey. I had male and female prey to see if there were any different things that could determine the preference of this animal. And going through this research and actually going through this process, I truly understood the scientific method, like the actual 
work of creating an experiment from something you're curious about. And it is, it is complex. You really have to go through trial and error. You have to think about every possible thing that could be linked to why an animal is behaving a certain way. So that process was really enriching for me. I understood science better. I understood kind of the effort that has to go into this type of research. And uh, I, this kind of crazy contraption that you see on the screen was something that I built myself. I got a bunch of PVC, I got buckets, I got GoPros and some lighting, and I created this thing. The Sai mud crab is a nighttime predator. So I had to make sure that this system was fully automated to run at night. I just left it there. I woke up the next morning running into the building with my fingers crossed, hoping everything was still working. <laughs> and most of the time, I'd say five out of 10 times, things went wrong, right? Things did not go right. I had to redo the experiment. I had to make things longer. I actually went three weeks longer than I was anticipating. So science is unpredictable and you have to be kind of ready to change at any moment. And that's one of the things that happens in STEM careers is that, you know, opportunities come up, your interests change, and you kind of have to change with the wind and how things are moving. So I was able to do this research, which was super cool. I really loved diving in and getting my hands dirty and really working with my hands to get things done and to explore my interests. Uh, I was actually lucky enough to present my findings at a conference. So Rebecca and I went to Maine, Portland, Maine in March 2016, and we went to the benthic ecology meeting. Now, the word benthic basically is describing the bottom of the ocean. It's called the benthos. So like the mud, the soot, all the sand, that's the benthic area. So a lot of the presenters and different scientists that were there were studying very similar things to me. And it was really great to be in this environment to network with people who had similar interests. And this was like another like testing ground. I was meeting a whole bunch of new people, people from all over the world. I was nervous. I didn't know what to do. I was had to present, you know, with new people. And that's where I learned kind of like the skills of communicating science to different audiences and kind of helping people to understand what I had done for so long, because it's not very easy, right? I, I had been sitting on this research for two years, but someone coming up to my poster, that's their first time seeing it. So like, how do you get that message across? And that's part of STEM is communicating science to different people. So this was a really cool experience. I got to meet all different people. Um, after this, I kind of realized that sitting in research was a lot. Sitting in research and, and diving into like a PhD, that's a lot of work. And you really have to want uh, that specific thing that you're studying to be able to get through a PhD program. So my interest started to change. I was meeting new people. I was taking new classes in my degree. So my interests were expanding. The next thing that I kind of latched my passions onto was more of a technology side of STEM. So we used some technology when we were in the lab together. We used GoPros. We, you know, we're going out on boats every day and stuff like that. But actual like, you know, computer technology was something I hadn't used yet until I took a class about geographic information systems, which can also be abbreviated as GIS. I want you to think of this as like computer mapping. It's very popular now. People use it in literally every type of medium possible. But this was all new to me when I was an undergrad. I had never heard of it. I had never seen it before. But it is a program that you can use where you can just plug in data and create a map. And maps and visual media is really useful for getting people to understand different things, right? I'm presenting a PowerPoint right now with images. That is hopefully helping you to understand what you're looking at. So maps is another way that we can help people to understand these really complex ideas in nature and in science. So I worked um, with GIS technologies to kind of understand more about technology in STEM, but also to infuse a little bit of my interest because I wanted to stay in the ocean and I wanted to kind of keep this ocean rolling. So what I did was I looked at oysters in Chesapeake Bay and I wanted to see kind of the risk that these oysters were facing based on water treatment plants that were near them. So I was doing research down there. Um, I wasn't physically there, but thankfully there was a lot of public data that I was able to use and connect with people down there so I could do this remotely, but still make something out of it. So that's the map that you see on the right. This was done very early on in my career, so it's not my best work, but <laughs> it's something that I was proud of at the time. And I still am. The image on the left, um, and the kind of thing that relates to this very weird looking bat on your screen. After I did um, a couple of these classes, I was working with the same professor. And 
we were hitting it off. I had a good relationship with this person because I was interested in what she's doing and I was asking her questions. One of the best advice that I can give you as a young person, as an old person, Oh no, did Mike freeze for everyone? I think Mike froze. I, I, I was, there we go. Sorry, you froze for a oh second. Oh no, am I back? Yes. <laughs> oh no. Is it just me or is it everyone? If you're am still I back? There, am I good? Okay, I hear your voice, but you were frozen. Oops. Well, if anyone has any questions while Mike is, uh, indisposed at the moment, please write them in that chat. Um, for those of you who uh, have been involved in the marine science field at all, GIS is an ever growing, oh no, okay, yeah, he's gone, gone. That's fine, we'll give him a second to join again. Um, so for those of you who are in the marine science field, GIS is an ever growing skill set. It's something that so many people are requiring for their different fields. Um, because like Mike mentioned, the STEM field has now turned into the STEAM field where they are adding that art aspect back into that science realm. Um, so we've always been very much like when you picture a scientist, when you picture being a marine scientist, you are kind of just in a dark room, like with a microscope, with like a little lab set up, uh, working and trying to collect data. And when I initially went into the marine science field as well, that's sort of what I pictured where you're not really interacting or communicating with the public, you're just trying to find answers. Um, but the STEM field has absolutely evolved uh, over time. It has become more about finding those answers, but also communicating those answers to the public. Um, and that's become a huge portion. There we go. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Oh my gosh, I am so sorry. Totally fine. We were just chatting about STEM versus STEAM. Ooh, interesting. That's <laughs> That's great, friends. I apologize again that I got popped out, but um, I have a little bit more to talk about if you're willing. <laughs> there we go. You cool. should be a host again. You should be able to share. <laughs> awesome. Um, so I'm glad that we were talking about STEM and STEAM. Like I said, the addition of the arts in that acronym, I think is super important, especially for people who are artists and consider themselves equally a, as much a scientist to have that part of the STEM acronym is really important. And kind of what we're looking at right now is a a part of art. The map that I made on the right can be considered art. It's something that was, you know, you have to make pretty so that people can see it. Um, so one of the other things that I wanted to talk about with technology in STEM was I was able to connect with the professor. I asked her questions. We formed a relationship um, and she was able to kind of bring me in on the research that she was doing. And this was wildly different than uh, anything in the ocean. She was doing research on bats. I had no idea about bats. I knew nothing about them. They were really interesting to me, but I wasn't like throwing my my idea of technology and kind of put some more skills into my pocket and explore a new area of science that I wasn't aware of before. Taylor, can you hear me okay? Oh no. There we go. Yes. Are we back? Okay. Yes. I'm sorry, friends. Sometimes we're having <laughs> bit of crazy weather in New York, so that may be affecting the Wi-Fi. Totally understandable. We've all been there with the working at home situation. Yeah. The internet never yeah. wants to cooperate. Yep, but we're all good sports. We'll get through it. <laughs> so I was able to work um, with bats. Um, specifically, I had a partnership with the American Museum of Natural History in New York, and I was able to meet with mammologists there who were working with endangered bats all over the world, and they had this huge data set of information about endangered bats that they needed help with. They were creating computer models to basically plug and then create a map after that. So I was brought in on that team to help out with that effort. And it took me so much time just to create one model. I was responsible for creating a model for the order of bats called Mormupidae. And this was only one order of bats in a thousand or so. So we had a lot of work under our hands to do but it was really awesome. I was able to create this model. All you have to do is plug in the data and it creates a map that you can then edit afterwards. So this model is still in use, which I think is really fun, um, but it's another way that you can see the pathway of tech technology in STEM and how you can still infuse your interest in something completely different than what you're used to and still get an awesome product out of it. So after I did 
a lot of research in college. I worked in all these different labs and I kind of started to understand that maybe the route of a PhD isn't necessarily where I want to go. I don't think I want to be, you know, doing research for a long time. The thing that I realized through all of these experiences was that I really loved to talk to people about science. I loved to discuss with people like Taylor and my peers and especially people around me who weren't familiar with science. I wanted to get them to understand and love it as much as I did. I started to, after I graduate, look for education positions. And I was lucky enough to start out after a brief period of 10 months of unemployment <laughs> to get a job, a part-time job at a nonprofit that actually was in the same community that I spoke about before, Jamaica Bay. So this is in Rockaway. It was called the Rockaway Institute for Sustainability and Equity. So this is in an underserved community in Rockaway, which is right on Jamaica Bay. Their whole purpose was to invigorate the community about the ocean that they call home. This facility is right on the beach. And what's interesting is that a lot of people in this community just never had that connection with the ocean. They never had the resources to be able to understand and appreciate the things in their backyard. So that was our main mission. We met with young people. We met with people from all over the community. What was really cool is our building was a old firehouse that was repurposed for a community space. So we did farm shares. I ran cooking classes in there. We did experiments in there. We had class trips. We had art exhibits. It was a full multi-use space to invigorate the community about kind of being stewards of their environment. Um, so there's just some pictures up in here. This is me and my friend Ephraim. We had a class of high schoolers out. We were doing some beach scavenging and um, taking some sediment cores in Jamaica Bay, which was really cool. And the picture on the right is a huge hydroponic wall that we were growing. So we were growing local produce for the community, but we also had partnerships with farms in the community to create a farm share every week, which was super cool. So during this time, even though this was a part-time gig, uh, I wanted to do more. This was only a couple days a week, so I wanted to do more. I still wanted to, I was fresh out of college. I wanted to really dive into this career. So I started working at a local fishery um, that was a hatchery out east in Long Island. So they were hatching like trout and salmon, and they also had a couple of exhibits of different local species. So I was working as an educator out there. I was having field trips. So I was doing both of these things at the same time. And after about a year of doing this, I realized that I loved it. I absolutely fell in love with science education and talking to people about science. So for something bigger. I wanted a more solid position, something that I could stay in for a while and really dig my feet in and create um, like a stronghold at. So I was lucky enough to be hired as a full-time educator at the aquarium. And that's where I've been for the last two years. That's where I am now. We have um, a really interesting history. So the New York Aquarium is actually the oldest aquarium in the United States. It's one of the oldest animal facilities in the world. But the New York Aquarium is owned by a huge nonprofit called the Wildlife Conservation Society. So we're owned and operated by WCS. They also own the Bronx Zoo, the Central Park Zoo, and a couple other zoos in and around New York City. So this transition from like a small nonprofit to a huge organization was very interesting. I kind of learned how such a big organization works and where I fit in as an educator in that in that huge organization. But it also allowed me to have a huge amount of resources at my disposal. I was meeting new kids. I was meeting uh, new audiences. I was able to work with different people. It was really fun. We run summer camps over the summer. In the last year, we've done everything virtually, which has been a labor of love, as many of us <laughs> have been doing in the last year. Um, and these are just some pictures of kind of my time here. But while I was here, I was still curious about STEM. I wanted to expand my knowledge. I'm always looking to learn new things. I think that's one of the best things that you can do as a person interested in STEM is to follow your interests as much as you can and try to apply them to your career where they can. Thankfully, WCS has um, a program and a partnership with Miami University in Ohio. So I heard about this partnership. I was curious about possibly doing grad school and I pulled the plug. And this summer I started my master's degree at the Miami University studying sustainable land use. So my interests have now evolved into studying the land. I feel like I've gotten my full of studying the ocean. I love the ocean very much, but I really didn't know a lot about plants and forest ecology and soil ecology, something that is really, really important for the future of our planet, understanding how to 
use the land in a sustainable way where we can make food, make things that we need, but also reinvigorate these ecosystems to keep them healthy. So I've started this grad program. Um, thankfully, I'm able to do it and work at the, at the same time, which is really awesome. But I've been in this for the past, uh, I guess, six or seven months now, and I absolutely love it. It's kind of like my last jumping point of where I am right now. So friends, that was my that was my entire life story, basically. <laughs> I hope you got some ideas about STEM through that, but I'm open for any questions. If you have anything that you wanna ask me about STEM, about my kind of pathway through this, let me go back to sharing. There I am. If you wanna ask me something about STEM or something about my career, I am open to anything. I'm here for your questions. Beautiful. Well, thank you very much for that, Mike. Um, oh, no. Did I freeze again? You did for a little, but oh, man. can you hear me back? No? Yes. Sorry, y'all. I think I'm still frozen. Oh, no. You're moving oh, for us. Okay, so he can't hear me. But if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, when Mike unfreezes, we'll go through them. Um, we do have quite a few in the chat already, if you're able to open them, Mike. Ooh, can you hear me, Mike? Yeah. There we go. So, okay. um, do you want me? What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to switch my Wi Fi over. So. Okay. We will just hang out while they yep. do that. Uh, I, I think I can almost hear me. So I can. Oh, no. Um, it's coming in and out, but I'm going to switch. Okay. I'm going to switch my Wi Fi so it's on something a little bit more. Okay. Simple. Well, while Mike does that, Sorry, guys. Um, mm -hmm. take your time. Write questions in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. Anything you have to ask about STEM, um, anything you have to ask about any of those particular programs. Um, we do have quite a few questions already flooding in, so we'll just give give uh, it a minute to load through. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so one of the challenges of kind of being in this virtual space is like obviously connecting to the internet. So we have a hotspot that we use, and this is like the saving grace of any of my programs. <laughs> um, That's brilliant. Yeah, it's been it's been a lifesaver. So I'm gonna try and find this. There she is. There we go. Ooh, good questions. Well, while Mike jumps on over, um, we could write questions in the chat. Um, also talk about that whole STEM versus STEAM fields. Uh, like Mike said, there is a huge emphasis in the science field now uh, for communication as one of the major skills that includes GIS, that includes uh, marketing skills, utilizing social media is a huge thing. I see every single day um, people asking for marketing and social media liaisons uh, for scientific fields um, and scientific groups because scientists just don't know how to communicate. They don't. Um, I will be one of the first to say that like I went into science not really expecting to have to uh, communicate what we were researching and what we were doing to people who weren't fam familiar with the fields. Um, and most scientists do still approach it that way where they need that in between. They need that go between person who can take a bunch of statistics and numbers and like intimidating graphs and be able to communicate to someone who's completely unfamiliar with the field, what that means, what they could do to help. Um, and that has become a huge field in and of itself. Um, that is, as people are going through uh, marine science, environmental science, even just general biology, all the regular STEM fields that at least I'm familiar with, I'm not sure as much about uh, engineering and mathematics, sorry, that is not my forte, um, but it has become something that they're sort of encouraging those entering the field in their bachelors, even in high school, um, but definitely in masters as well to learn how to communicate properly um, and learn how to communicate what you're researching to the group. Oh wait, I just remembered Mike was jumping in on their iPad. So I was just gonna double check that they're not stuck in the participants wing. Um, but as we hang out and wait for Mike to jump on, um, I did want to talk a little bit about SOMAS. So like Mike said, we used to work together uh, up on Long Island at that 
really cool oceanography center that they built in Southampton. Um, and there was a huge emphasis on seagrass specifically for the uh, Brad Peterson lab. Um, pardon me as I also grab my phone, make sure that Mike isn't trying to answer um, me through there. But uh, so there was a huge emphasis on seagrass up north. Um, that is one of their major ecosystems. There was also a huge emphasis on algal blooms, um, algae blooms, red tide. Um, the Gobler lab was the biggest lab at Stony Brook um, that definitely got uh, quite a bit of the funding because it was addressing such an important issue. For those of you who are from Florida, we get the red tide season um, where we get the red tides killing a lot of stuff on our shoreline, um, eutrophication when there's a bunch of runoff, a bunch of nutrients into the waters that causes an algae bloom that will then turn our oceans red, just like during that red tide season. Um, but for other areas, uh, they have very similar problems where, especially on Long Island, where the water is sort of cut off from the ocean. A lot of them are bays, a lot of them are uh, inlets where they don't have as much mixing as we do just on a straight coastline. So if there's something like an algal bloom, um, it becomes a problem because there's no way for it to be mixed out. There's no way for it to, ooh, I think that's Mike. There's no way for it to uh, be released back into the ocean and get some new water coming in, new oxygen, new nutrients. Um, and that causes quite a problem up on Long Island. Hi y'all. Yeah. So I made it back. <laughs> I apologize so much for the disconnection. What we're going to do now, we're kind of switching gears and going into our exhibit. I love that you have questions. I'm here to answer them. I want to make sure I get to show you the shark exhibit also. What Kayla is going to do, she's going to show you a video of what this exhibit was and kind of the history that it has. It went through a lot. You're going to watch that video. I'm going to run over to the shark exhibit. And as we're going through this building, I will answer your questions that you had in the chat before. Does that sound good? I think that's good. Awesome. I will... You are the best. Thank you so much for your flexibility. <laughs> <laughs> I will start sharing that video now. Um, if you have any problems hearing it, throw it in the chat, guys. Wonderful. Let's see. Ooh, make sure I'm sharing my computer sound. OK. The New York Aquarium has a long history, not just with the New York Zoological Society, but with the city of New York. We were founded in Castle Clinton in the Battery in 1896. We're the oldest aquarium in the United States. After a long and illustrious run there, where we were often the most visited attraction in New York City, we were moved to the Bronx Zoo in the 40s in order to make room for the construction of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. It was Robert Moses who brought us back to Brooklyn right here in Coney Island in 1957, where we've been ever since. We were all set for the aquarium's biggest capital expansion project in our history, an exhibit designed to inform New Yorkers about the ocean around us, when the ocean around us rose up. This exhibit is a transformative moment for the aquarium because it combines a, a building and exhibitry in a way that is so closely linked with our mission and our conservation work in the New York seascape. Ocean Wonders Sharks really bridges the gap between the aquarium and the ocean. You get great views of the boardwalk. People on the boardwalk can view back um, up at this building and give them a sense of this wild place that's right off of our shores. I believe also that it's gonna be transformative for our visitors because as they come through and discover all these great things about sharks, they will get to see them up close and hopefully make that emotional connection that's so important to beginning to care about sharks and why they're important to healthy oceans. Modern zoos and aquariums are uniquely positioned to help save and protect species in the wild. We bring a diverse set of skills and expertise to the table. In the case of our staff at the New York Aquarium, they work collaboratively with our field staff from the Global Conservation Program. We do shark tagging to discover migratory patterns of different species of shark, 
and we even study nurseries where juvenile sand tiger sharks hopefully can grow and survive into adulthood where they'll join the wild breeding population in the oceans around us. This exhibit is designed to engage New Yorkers, to inspire them, but not just to inspire them for the moment in which they're in the exhibit itself, but to build a relationship that goes on much longer than the visit, where they work with us to support us in our engagement around protecting the wildlife and wild places that exist right here in New York's waters. Start the next one. There we go. Oh, it's so beautiful. I'm very jealous. Oops. I thought I'd take a quick video of them cleaning. There we go. <laughs> I had one of those videos going. Let's see. We are going to promote my two panelists again. And then they should be able to pop on. There we go. Hi, all. Hello. Welcome, welcome back. Hi. We made it. <laughs> awesome. So friends, thank you for sitting through that. Uh, that was a video of kind of the history of this building. So right now we are in the front of this building. This is the first exhibit that we see as we walk in. This building is called Ocean Wonder Sharks. And like you saw in the video, the whole premise of this is to really connect Coney Island and New York communities to the ocean ecosystem that is right outside of our door. So we have sharks in this exhibit. There are some really amazing species that we'll get to see today. This is kind of like the first, you know, wow room that you walk into. We wanted this to be a really stunning feature and a memorable thing when people walk into the building for the first time. This building, uh, almost half of it is focused on local species. This is one of the only tanks that does not focus on local New York species. This is a tropical tank. So some of the, or most of the shark species that you're seeing in this tank do not live in New York. You won't find them in New York waters, but they are found in other parts of the world. We have black tip reef sharks that are swimming above us here. There are three black tip reef sharks in this particular tank. Black tip reef sharks are one of the coolest, I think, and one of the most special types of sharks that are in the ocean. They're what's considered a keystone species. So that term basically represents a species that is really important in a particular ecosystem. And if they were ever removed or if their numbers were super low, the ecosystem would collapse and everything below it would kind of collapse. So black tip reef sharks are responsible for keeping the reef in check. They keep fish populations in check and they have a really important role to play. So the kind of star of the show in this tank is this beautiful goober that you're looking at here. This is Captain Spaulding, or just Captain for short. He is a zebra shark that is in this tank, and he's a very special zebra shark. So normally, zebra sharks look like this. So Captain Spaulding is much different than what zebra sharks normally look like. Normally, they're born with these really beautiful brown colors and dots all over their body. However, Captain Spaulding was not born with those colors. He was born with not enough pigment in his skin to create those patterns. So he is called leucistic. So he's not technically um, like albinistic. He doesn't have no pigment in his skin. He still has some pigment, but it just doesn't allow him to create those types of colors. And now friends, our sea lion show just got out. So it may get a little noisy in here, but I hope you are able to hear me. If at any point you can't hear what I'm saying, just let me know. So Captain Spaulding is the coolest. He is my absolute favorite. And he's part kind of, of one of the stars of this tank. So as we move through, I'm gonna talk more about these different exhibits. The next room that we look at, sorry guys, if it gets a little loud, I'll see if I can move ahead a bit. The next room that we're gonna check out um, is to introduce people to the anatomy of sharks and kind of their biology and the history of how they form. So. This exhibit was initially designed to be really sensitive and to have touching exhibits, things that you can smell and kind of touch with screens. With COVID, we've had to modify it a little bit so that people can still get enrichment out of this exhibit, but without exposing themselves to anything. So we have exhibits talking about the gestation periods of sharks, how long they take to give birth, which a lot of people aren't familiar with. Sharks take a very, very long time to give birth. They take their sweet time. They make sure everything's right before they release their pups. So 
that's one of the problems in conserving sharks is that when we're taking so many of them out of the ocean, it's hard for them to bounce back because of that long period of birth and that long gestation period. So we have a really cool screen that you can see. You can actually pull up different shark species and see the shark itself. You can choose different behaviors to see that shark doing. This is a great hammerhead shark that I'm sure many of you in Florida are familiar with. So as we go through, we also have an exhibit about shark finning. This is one of the biggest threats that sharks are facing. This is an exhibit that's meant to kind of really not spook people, but get them kind of almost shocked about what fisheries are doing to different sharks. It can be jarring to a lot of people. We do have a warning listed saying disturbing content. So we wanna make sure people have the choice to see this information or not. But this is one of the main focuses of this building is to really have people understand the impact that humans are having on these important species. So as we move through, we're getting a little closer to New York. We wanna know what kind of sharks are in our backyard, the species that we are so close to. And this next exhibit is called the New York Bite. Now that is spelled B-I- G-H-T. Now the New York bite is basically like a pizza sliced or pizza shaped body of water off the coast of Manhattan. So it's about 81 miles off the coast of Manhattan. And you can find stingrays, you can find sharks, there are whales that live in this space as well. It is a bustling hub of biodiversity for a lot of marine species that are local to New York. So this tank is here to represent this ecosystem and to show the sharks and species that are there. The stingray species that you see swimming around, they're called a cow nose ray. I'm sure many of you are familiar with them in Florida. They can be found all along the North, or North America, the East Coast of North America. The species of shark that's in here is a juvenile sandbar shark. There are two of them. Sandbar sharks can be found in New York and in around the North Atlantic, but they spend a lot of time in New York water. So they're one of the most uh, endemic species that we have here. This is a juvenile. The next tank that we're gonna go into, you're gonna see one of the big, bigger adults, which is really cool. What's also is really cool about uh, this exhibit is that there's a lot of signage that talks about the local efforts that are happening in New York Harbor. So we have interactive exhibits that are not open right now due to COVID, but people can still read the signage and understand the efforts of local fishermen, local shipping lanes, and how those things are changing to adapt to make sure that these animals are living in a healthy habitat, but also that humans are getting the things that we need. So this whole building uh, is wrapped around research. We actually have a, our very own research team that's based out of the New York Aquarium it's called Seascape or the New York Seascape, and they're responsible for studying sharks in and around New York. They're also responsible for studying cetaceans or whales and dolphins. We have lots of whales in New York Harbor that come every year. So we have a lot of research that is being done on these guys and their migration patterns. We have buoys out in New York Harbor listening to these whales talk to one another, which is really cool. Another cool part of this exhibit is that there's a tunnel that you can walk through and kind of sit in and look up at all the fish swimming above you, which I think is really cool. As we move in, we're almost to the end of this building, but we're not quite there yet. This next area that we're gonna be seeing is about shipwrecks. I know there's lots of shipwrecks in the Keys and in Florida and in and around Florida's coast. And there's also a lot of shipwrecks in New York, which people don't really realize. There are plenty of shipwrecks in New York and they create structure and habitat for animals. So New York is filled with shipwrecks and we kind of wanted to show um, this, it's a little hard to see in the dark, but this whole exhibit looks like a rusted shipwreck with all these different corals on them. Oh, look who's sweet enough to pay us a visit. It is our lovely turtle. This is our um, loggerhead sea turtle, Blue. I haven't seen her in weeks. It's so good to see you. So she's here. I'm so excited to see her and I'm, I was hoping she would come out and say hi to us. This is Blue. She's a loggerhead sea turtle. She's about 30 or so years old. She's been with us for a very long time, but she is the only sea turtle that is in this tank. So this tank is, what you're looking at is just a very small portion of this tank. I'll go into the next room and you'll see actually how large this place is. But Blue is one of the most famous animals that we have here. She kind of has a reputation for herself. <laughs> I know that Meek has a lot of turtles as well. Taylor, you've worked with turtles, I know. So it's kind of cool that you came us to say hi to us. So Blue's here. She is a native species to New York. You can find them in New York waters. They uh, as you know, turtles migrate all over the world. So they have a really wide range of where they can be found. So as I move into the next room, it's really the crown jewel of this building. 
And this exhibit is called Hudson Canyon's Edge. So it is a massive tank that is filled with local species, sharks, stingrays, turtles. There are actually Atlantic sturgeon in this tank that you can see. And again, this whole building is meant to get people familiar with the animals that live in their backyard, specifically sharks. So Hudson Canyon Edge, Hudson Canyon's Edge, sorry guys, is a deep water canyon that's about 80 miles off the coast of New York City. So I want you to imagine the Grand Canyon and sink it to about you know, 2000 feet deep. That is what Hudson Canyon's Edge is. Now this is a really important place for a lot of marine species. So there are sharks that breed here. There are whales that rest here with their young. There are whales that also feed here. It's a big feeding ground for a lot of bigger animals. So this space is immediately, we knew that this was one of the habitats that we wanted to share with people and get people excited about. So we have this massive tank in order to do just that, to share people you know, this area in the ocean that they might have might not have been familiar with. Oh, there's Blue again. She's taking a dive on the right side of the tank there. I haven't seen her in so long. I'm so glad that she came out today. I was really hoping for it. So this tank that you're looking at, all the water that you're seeing is about 450 million, or sorry, 450,000 gallons of water. It's a ton of water. What's really special about our aquarium is that we are right on the beach. So we are right on Coney Island Beach, I'm about 100 feet from the beach at any time when I'm here. And that allows us to pull in salt water from the ocean to use in our tank. So this tank gets water straight from the ocean. It goes through a tremendous process of filtering before it gets into our tanks, but it does come from the ocean itself, which I think is really cool. If you're an aquarium on the mainland, you have to create your own salt water, which is a very expensive and tedious process. So. I think we're very lucky in the sense that we get to kind of have our own salt water straight from the ocean. Now, friends, this is almost the end, but I wanna make sure I leave time for questions. I saw a lot of questions in the chat before. If you have those, you can ask me now and I'd be happy to answer them. Um, would it be helpful if I read them off to you, Mike? Sure, that would be great. There we go. Let's see, scrolling all the way to the top. Um, TJ asks, why was a whole lab dedicated to seagrass? Is there just a ton that lives in it or is it an endangered ecosystem? That's a great question, CJ. So the reason that seagrass was chosen for that lab's purpose was because it's such a prominent habitat in New York and it's one of the declining habitats in New York. So Stony Brook realized that this was a resource that we needed to upkeep. So a lot of funding was given towards that. So scientists like Dr. Peterson wanted to use that funding to boost up this ecosystem. Seagrass is actually like, it's an incredible ecosystem. It's one of the biggest carbon sinks in our ocean. So it actually takes CO2 out of the atmosphere, which is helping stop climate change. So that's like one of the benefits to increasing the health of seagrass ecology. It's a great question. Awesome, yeah, we love our seagrass. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um, TJ also asks, is approaching a species like bats super different from studying marine species? Um, do you know, do you remember which species specifically that was? The bats or the marine species? Oh, it may, oh, bats. Okay. So bats. in terms of bats, um, it was a little different just in terms of like the actual like biology and the ecosystem that they were in. However, I was still using GIS technologies to study those animals. So I had used GIS to study oysters in the past. I had used it to study seagrass in the past. So applying it to study a terrestrial animal like a bat wasn't as different as I thought it was going to be. It was actually pretty similar in the ways that um, I applied that technology to it. Nice. Um, Lucas asks, what's your main focus right now with marine science? That's a great question. So my, my main focus right now really in terms of marine science resolves around my job. So my job right now is to teach people about the ocean and to get them excited about ocean conservation. So that's my main focus in terms of the ocean. However, I just started grad school, so I'm changing focus a little bit and focusing more towards the land because I'm realizing that in the future, I would love to know how to farm and <laughs> to create my own food and to share that knowledge with people. So right now I'm really learning how to tend to the land to make food sustainably and make sure I'm not damaging the ecosystem when I do that. I love that. That is so important. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, we have Wendy asking, do you think STEM students need graduate degrees to be successful? 
Oh, absolutely not. The only thing that you need is experience. And that experience comes through connecting with people, asking questions, um, you know, taking opportunities when they come to you, volunteering in different places, making relationships with people. That's really the most valuable thing that you can have in your pocket as a STEM professional. The only reason that I decided to go after a master's degree was because I wanted to learn more and I wanted more opportunities for myself. So I was fortunate enough to be able to do this, but you don't need that type of like upper degree really to have an impact in STEM and to feel solidified in a STEM career. That's a really common misconception that people have is like, I have to get a PhD to do anything. Like, no, you're totally fine. You can volunteer, you can work with people, keep up those relationships with people like me and Taylor are doing right now. Like it's, it's great to have those connections. Absolutely, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see, we have uh, Raquel asking, for someone in the psychology field interested in animal behavior, do you see overlaps mm -hmm. between STEM or see different dis uh, disciplines working together on research projects? Absolutely. So like STEM is a great acronym, but it can kind of also be like misleading in that it creates a little bit of a niche in the science field that like only technology and engineering and math like can come together and create something awesome. One of the things that I've been uh, learning about in grad school is the power of community and bringing in every possible expert, every field possible in order to create a better world. And I did a whole project last semester about urban farms in the Rockaways and how, you know, those farms are working with local soil scientists, they're working with local social workers to get people connected to the farm. So you can find different disciplines, you know, in any part of STEM and really connect them to whichever mission you're going after. It depends on, you know, the goal that you want to accomplish. If you want people to be a part of that mission, psychology is really important. Understanding people, being able to communicate with them is part of that. So I encourage um, more disciplines to come together and kind of create a better effort towards these goals. That's a really good question. Absolutely. When you got kicked off, we talked a little bit about STEAM. And I don't know if you've seen this trend, but I've definitely seen mm -hmm. that it is very much a they're asking for uh, more skills in marketing and communication mm -hmm. and things like that in the STEM field. So being well-rounded and having a background in psych is a huge asset. Oh, totally. And that kind of goes into like taking every opportunity you can just to build up every, like you don't have to be, what's the saying? Like I'm a, uh, a master of none. You have to have like, yeah you know, you dip your toes into every bucket that you can, but you don't have to master one thing to make a difference. You can have a lot of experience in different fields and still be successful. Absolutely. We have Vlad saying, thank you for a very interesting story of your life. Your photos and presentation are beautiful. <laughs> oh, thank you, Vlad. That's very sweet of you. I'm happy to be here. Um, Caitlin says, blue is adorable. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, friends, what's... What's really cool right now is um, they're actually feeding our sand tiger shark. So if you see, see that yellow dot right there? Oh, yep. It's kind of in between the fish. That's what's called a target. It's something that our sharks can recognize when it's in the water. So they swim over it to be fed. So that target's way in the back. They're feeding the sand tigers, which are not out right now because they're all in the back trying to get fed. But that little yellow thing is where that is happening. So I'll keep the camera focused there so you can kind of see it happening in real time. Did we have more questions? Um, I think we have two more questions, but I also want to say our sea turtle's name is Captain, just like your uh, <gasps> shark. Oh my gosh, that's and so we, cool. We target feed her <laughs> as well. We use a purple target and she comes right up to it to feed. <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh. Target training was definitely one of the things that I had no idea about before I worked at an aquarium. It's so cool. Same, it is life-saving when you have multiple species. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Let's see, we have Sky asking, is there one major factor threatening the marine life off of New York coastline? What can we do to help? Ooh, one major factor affecting the coastline of New York. So what's really great in the last five years is that actually New York Harbor has increased its water quality like tenfold. We are actually on a really good path to a healthier ecosystem in New York. And that has come about through the efforts of nonprofits investing in oysters. So oysters are really incredible because they filter water, um, they clean the ecosystem, they provide structure for certain local species. So oysters was one of the biggest things that we use to help clean up the water. So I would say 
water quality and keeping the water clean. I'm, I'm doing a whole project this semester about ocean pollution and what the word pollution means. Like when people think of pollution, they think of, oh my God, plastic and this plastic bag, this plastic bottle. But there's a lot of pollution that we don't physically see like nitrogen and carbon dioxide. So those things are also really important to think about the type of pollution that is invisible, quote unquote, to human eyes. I would say that is the biggest thing, focusing on water quality and keeping the water healthy. Very cool. I think that's our last question. Um, I did Great. want to just say thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation. I know we all learned so much about it. Um, and it was a great, a great walk down memory lane for me. Yeah. <laughs> the pictures of Snowmass broke my heart. <laughs> Friends, but I had so much fun. I really, I really appreciate this opportunity. I had a great time interacting with you all. I'm glad that you were able to see this kind of window into New York if you've never been here before. Definitely come through if you're ever in the area. <laughs> And I'm just excited that you're interested in STEM like I am. I think that, that this is a bright future for a lot of us. So I'm happy to be here and I'm glad that I was able to come. Yes, thank you for coming and thank you all for coming yeah. and watching. Um, if you are free next Saturday, we just posted our March schedule. March 1st is the beginning of sea turtle season down here in Florida, sea turtle nesting season. And we actually have had, I think, two leatherback nests come up early. So those sea turtle moms are all <sighs> in those nests. We are uh, out there marking them, making sure that they're safe and protected. And next Saturday at 1 p.m., our program coordinator, Kelly Martin, is going to come on and give us a breakdown of what to expect this sea turtle nesting season. So please join us then. Um, if you missed any of this, it is recorded. I have to go through and do a quick edit, make sure that everything is OK, and then it'll be posted to our YouTube channel. So just find us on YouTube or any of the socials at Seek the Meek. Otherwise, thank you. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, everyone, for coming, and we'll see you again soon.